Good evening. My name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, a monthly town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers, together with the faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. Politics has no beginnings and no ends, but elections provide pretty compelling signposts along the way in trying to assess which party and perhaps which policy prescriptions are supported by the American people. Last month's election appears to have provided some clarity. President Obama wanted, won a decisive victory, becoming the first president elected twice with more than 50 percent of the vote since Ronald Reagan. Democrats strengthened their grip on the Senate and cut into the continuing Republican control of the House of Representatives. This was an election with signature issues that should drive even hyperpartisan Washington into doing at least a little bit of the people's business. With the so-called fiscal cliff looming at the end of this year, inaction in Washington could see deep across-the-board cuts to defense and domestic programs that, that economists say could drive the country back into recession. At the same time, the full Bush tax cuts would expire, raising taxes on all Americans and not just those in the top 2 percent that Obama wants to see. Obama notes that he was very clear throughout the campaign that he wanted to raise taxes on those with the highest incomes and that the American people, first in the election and now in post-election polls, indicate that they support him. Republican Speaker John Boehner argues that his party retained control of the House of Representatives and has its own mandate. Even though, even though Democratic congressional candidates got more votes nationwide than Republicans, one sign posted the power of redistricting to define the political landscape. And Kentucky Senator Mitch McConnell, the Republican minority leader, is howling that Democratic moves to reform the filibuster his caucus has used to a degree unprecedented in American history, threatened to poison what I suppose he thought were amicable relations in, the, in, in Congress's upper chamber. Everybody in Washington now says they want a deal. Even as they draw lines in the sand, they will not cross. It is a recipe for continued gridlock, only now the stakes are higher. Even recovery funds in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, which devastated so many parts of New York and the region and killed more than 40 people in the city alone, could get caught in the crossfire. We're joined by four New Yorkers who, who observe and take part in the debates over what the election means and what we can expect and hope for in the new year, or even before, if the parties can see their way clear to resolve some of the issues during their lame duck session. David Birdsell is the dean of, public of, uh, is the, is the dean of the School of Public Affairs at Baruch College. Mark Lieberman is an economist and, and contributing editor at CUNY TV. Esther Fuchs is a professor at Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. And Ron Daniels is a professor of political science at York College. David, I'm going I'm to start with you. You're the dean, so you, out, so you outrank the rest of us. Always the worst position. Um, <laughs> um, if you look back at the election, was this a defining election? I don't know if we know the answer to that yet, but I'd point to three themes that seem to structure the election for me. Number one is message. The Obama campaign in 2008 was a force of nature in many ways, but it was also a Rorschach blot. Whatever you thought hope was going to be and whatever you thought governing from the center was going to be, it became. And it became hard to manage. It became hard to manage in the House. It became hard to manage in the general population, backed up by a president who refused to robustly defend his own policies. That really changed for the Obama campaign in this cycle. Uh, he talked very specifically about certain policies, not to the satisfaction of all, but we know he wants a balance between revenue and spending cuts in order to bring the budget back into line. We know that he wants to see certain uh, civil liberties protected. It was an articulate and a coherent campaign. Number two, we saw the triumph of demographics. Now, Demographics don't win elections by themselves, but married to a message that speaks to emergingly important aspects of the public and larger and larger segments of the electorate, that really created a winning combination that not too many people, particularly on the right wing of American politics, was able to see. And that leads me to number three, and that is campaigning. Uh, the Romney campaign was, I thought, spectacularly bad. Stuart Stevens' mea culpa in today's Washington Post notwithstanding. Uh, but what was bad about it is they thought that it was going to be an election that looked like, and an electorate that looked like, 2008 or even 2004. How you can believe that in the face of, a of changing American demographics, I don't know. I don't believe anybody's going to be able to make that mistake going forward. Um, as we come out of the election, we're facing the fiscal cliff, the fiscal curve, whatever you, know, whatever you want to call it. Um, how serious are the stakes, and um, are, we, are we facing gridlock, or are the Republicans at least starting to say, well, the election really did mean something, as a, as a Democratic partisan's uh, point of view? Well, we are facing a fiscal cliff, more like a fiscal slope, actually, that, uh, because nothing's going to hit 
like that. And it's not going to be the January 1st, suddenly we fall off of something. But a lot of things, absent any action by Congress, are going to disappear. Some things we've read about, some things we haven't read about. Uh, there are some minor points in the tax code that change that will affect your mortgage payments for those of you who have mortgages. But the big things, of course, are the Bush-era Bush tax cuts, which have been misrepresented as a, as a tax increase on those earning over $250,000. It's a tax increase on that portion of income that is over $250,000. Somebody who it's earns $250,001 will still rate. get... Under the, under the president's proposal, still get a tax reduction or retain the tax reduction that he or she has had. The other parts of it are confusing because uh, either our politicians don't want to or have refused to explain things. So, for example, we bundle together entitlements and Social Security. I would argue that Social Security is not an entitlement. It is deferred compensation. People have earned that money. It's as if your, pre your pension was revoked or changed. That was part of the agreement when you came to work, that some of your money you would get every week or every two weeks, and the rest of it you would get later on. Similarly with Social Security, we've been contributing into it, and therefore your take-home pay has been reduced. You contributed into it in the anticipation of receiving something. Now, Social Security shouldn't be part of this debate. It's not part of the deficit. It became part of the deficit because it's funded through the contributions that are taken out of your taxes every, every week or every two weeks, out of your income, rather. It became part of the deficit when the payroll tax reduction was, was postponed or deduction was, was changed so the 2% came back to you. Social Security continued to be funded, but that 2% came from the general treasury, which made it part of the budget. And we can talk later on about Medicare and Medicaid and the, and the sequestration. But we are facing a serious problem because we have seen quarter after quarter, as government spending goes down, growth in GDP has been held back. Esther, uh, we've gone through recent elections about soccer moms, about, uh, about all, you know, about that they were focused on suburban voters. It seems to me, and perhaps this goes back to the... Uh, uh, demo, to the uh, demographic point that David was making, that there was more talk of issues relevant to cities. Well, I don't know if there was actually a lot more talk about issues relevant to cities, but certainly city voters, for the first time since 1980, made the difference in this election. Um, there's no question from looking at the data that in the swing states of Colorado, of Ohio, and of Florida, um, and Virginia, that the inner cities and their suburban ring, the closest suburban areas that look most like the cities demographically, were the key to Obama's victory in those swing states where they thought he might not actually win. And then, of course, in the other swing states, they were hugely moved forward by the urban vote. So this is the first time since 1980 Reagan, you know, was a a trailblazer in many ways and one of the things he did was win the presidency without winning one single city major city he lost in every major city which of course gave him a free reign to ignore cities and city issues for a long time so this transition this recognition that cities were critical to obama's majority coalition for winning should give us a little bit more clout in this presidency in the past as you said the soccer mom you know representing uh the suburban vote in some way uh, was really where it was viewed the swing vote was very critical and um uh, so cities were ignored. So I expect that uh, at least we're going to be more vocal this time. And I think you combine that with the change in the Senate, uh, 20 women senators. Now, when you look at the research on whether women representatives uh, vote the same way as men or are different, um, the interesting part about that is on, on the social issues that are usually considered the feminist agenda, issues of uh, abortion rights and equal pay for equal work, men and women tend to agree on that. But what women do in the legislature is they bring up issues 
around social welfare, uh, around urban issues, around poverty, and around things like gun control. And we might see a uh, change in the kind of legislation that gets put forward with 20 women in the Senate. So I think that's important. The other statistic that just kind of blew me away from the outcome of, the, of this race was single women. Single women voted 67 percent for Barack Obama. They tend to be, they tend to live in cities when you're single. You are more likely to be living in the cities and the suburbs. And a big part of that motivator was just the disgust and the feeling of being insulted by the Republican agendas around women's issues of birth control and right to, right to choice. Um, and uh, also uh, the issues around for older women, Social Security and Medicaid. Was so this is significant. On, was there a stat on single moms? Um, just just, just the curious. stat, I didn't see that. I just saw the stat on women in general mm -hmm. went 55% for Obama. And the youth vote, another very important vote for the second time, uh, as, as David was saying, 60%. And this is very important because people thought that Obama's original coalition wouldn't turn out again. Remember, they were talking about the enthusiasm gap and young people weren't going to turn out and, and blacks weren't going to turn out. Well, they did. They turned out and they voted in large numbers for Obama. Even the Jewish vote, which there was a big effort to break that Jewish vote, 69% went for Obama. It was, it was actually Hispanics, 71%, blacks, 93%, and Jews, 69%. Solid in his camp. So this is a, a new majority coalition, and it goes back to David's point. Uh, you can't win now with only white males from the Midwest, even counting the Electoral College as part of the calculus. Uh, that This is the new winning coalition, and I believe that if the Republican Party continues to ignore these voters, they will become either a disappearing party or they will become a regional party of the South. Ron, um you talk about urban voters. She talked about women being turned off by the kind of misogynistic nonsense, frankly, that the Republicans, I'm not sure what, what, you know, what century they were living in. Um, <laughs> but she talks about uh, voters of color coming out, you know, you know significant Asian American <laughs> support for the president that you didn't see in the past. Um, how much of that was driven by the voters, by the uh, voter suppression efforts? I mean, I must tell, tell you, there's little that shocks me at my old age, but that was shocking. Well, let me, let me first say that as someone who worked on Jesse Jackson's campaign in 1988 as deputy campaign manager and executive director of the Rainbow Coalition, what I would say emphatically is I would color it by saying this is the emergence, this coalition is sort of a fulfillment of the Rainbow Coalition. And I think it is, in fact, futuristic. It's not necessarily permanent, uh, but driven, I think, largely by people of color uh, in numbers that have already been cited, except the Asian vote was also somewhat of a surprise. I think about 68 percent, which is like a shift, because the Asian vote has tended to be somewhat ambivalent and, and maybe even trending some towards Republicans. But 68 percent this time decisively, decisively for uh, Obama. <clears throat> in the African-American community in particular, if there's one thing that will drive people to move is telling black people you can't vote or that somebody's going to mess with the black vote. There are even times when the Voting Rights Act or some provision that's coming up, rumors start circulating that the right to vote is being repealed. I mean, that's how ingrained this is in the African-American community. Well, people literally died for the vote. Right, and so it drove, so it drove uh, African-Americans at 93 percent this time. That was actually a slight dip from 96 percent last time. Uh, there's probably some reasons for that. But in critical states like Ohio, for example, uh, not only was it a, the turnout was the percentage high, but the turnout was higher. So you went from 11% uh, uh, to 14%, which actually helped to create the margin for victory. So I think the voter suppression stuff, like the money stuff, actually backfired big time in terms of people's determination, as I say, to march on ballot boxes. Anytime people are standing in lines in America, the United States of America, seven, eight, nine hours, it is absolutely r ridiculous. But nonetheless, people were willing to do that. And they are saying, we were not going to let anybody turn us around. But the, but the Republicans, you, you kind of made this point, um, leading up into the election saying, we're going to win. I mean, and I believe that they were sincere. I believe, they, I believe that they really believed it. And because their model of the electorate <laughs> did not account 
for, it's, you know, especially Latinos. I mean, we haven't talked about Latinos. I believe that Latinos are the voters who drove this election into Obama's camp in, in states like Nevada, in states like Colorado, in states, you know, okay. I mean, not so much New Mexico. I wasn't surprised when New Mexico, excuse me, and frankly has the potential to turn Texas within, Florida. within a decade. Yeah. And Florida. Florida, even among the Cuban and, voters, and, and, considered and, and, more conservative. It was an even split. Some polls said that he won the Cuban vote. Some said he lost the Cuban vote. But what kind of a calculation did they make? They thought that the electorate, that was coming out was very different. Well, this wasn't just the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had some independent polling organizations. Gallup issued not a poll, but an explanation of their uh, understanding of the electorate on October 26th. On October 26th, they said two things, both of which were extraordinary. The first was that this year would look like 2008. The second, which was just the biggest whopper in that paper, is that 2008 looked like 2004. You can give them, you can cut them some slack on the 2012 projection because it's still a projection, but 2008 was just flat wrong. You'd seen the white proportion of the electorate erode by three percentage points um, and the reverse on the black and Latino side of the electorate and Asians. I think it's an important point. It's an emerging electoral block in terms of enthusiasm and turnout, not to mention size. Um, but it's just moving, and they didn't account for that, and there was some external support for that. But I have to return to a point. I don't think the demographics are clearly important. Uh, we will see in time, we don't know if it will be 16 or 20, Texas go, Arizona go, that we're going to flop and there will be a different kind of majority politics there. But if we go all the way back to George W. Bush in 2000, he was polling much more effectively among Latinos, up to 40 percent of the vote, 45 percent support in certain pockets getting majorities. Uh, and that was based on an appeal to that population. They did not do that this year. In fact, they did exactly the yeah. reverse. But you're um, going to see, I think, pardon the interruption, you're going to see Republicans maintaining a degree of control because Republicans have been very clever in controlling reapportionment machinery. Yes. Reapportionment machinery. So they continue, in the House. In not only in the House of Representatives, but in the state legislatures. State legislatures. So they right. continue to control that, and that's going to continue to drive the makeup of the Congress as well as state legislators. Look at New York, for example. More people ca voted for Democrats for the New York State Senate. There were more Democratic votes in this for candidates for the state Senate than Republican votes, yet the Republicans, with a couple of uh, flip-flops among elected Democrats, the Republicans will end up controlling the New York State Senate. Well, and this is an important point because the, the, the reapportionment battle is baked in until 2020, and we know mm -hmm. that, uh, because we need a new census to change that around. But you may well wind up with a Republican Party that doesn't fade into obscurity, but continues to control the House. That's plausible. Uh, some of the variables here, do Republicans begin, as many Republicans, Marco Rubio, others are making the argument, they need to make a different case on immigration and other uh, issues that can either fragment uh, the Latino community or look at it otherwise. But we have a Republican House, just as so we have those 20 new uh, uh, right. women and members of the Senate, 19 new House chairmen, all men, all white. But there That's are two questions message. I was That's just going to say that are emerging here. Um, one is, you know, is the reapportionment thing baked in the way you're saying, or will it emerge and become uh, like the voter suppression issue? Because yeah. we, and we have campaign finance, so we've had what, uh, Eight billion dollars uh, spent, six billion dollars spent. What's a couple? Of billion uh, yeah, dollars? what's a couple right. of billion between, between friends. friends spent in the last election? So, will the Supreme Court reconsider Citizens uh, Citizen United decision? Not this. Supreme um, Court. How long will this Supreme Court be in place? Will Obama get to appoint new Supreme Court justices and create a different kind of majority in the courts, which is a very, very important uh, point? for the direction of public Which policy. Which was never raised during the campaign. Well, they didn't Nobody raise campaigned it. about the Supreme Court. I think because it's from the public's point of view, and, and you know, well, David it was, can it was, speak it was to a that, part too. Of the, it was I think it was, it was, it was part of the mix. Well, it was certainly no a part one of the votes mix on the, the Supreme American Court. Because those of us who were doing talk radio and so forth, we're driving that point home. I mean, we did not want another Plessy versus Ferguson mm -hmm. moment here. But let me just also say this, that the Republicans have a problem because they have to not just reach out, they have to reach out with a change in message. They're in a kind of bind. I right. mean, the issues that they, that have, are the core of what has become essentially a conservative party, unlike the Republican Party that we have known for many, many years that had both a conservative, moderate, and liberal wing. This is essentially a conservative Republican Party. So it's kind of trapped in terms of its ability to reach out because it has to change its message. It cannot just simply go to the Latino community and these different communities or women and whatever and say we're reaching out to you or like Ann Romney said, bless her soul, 
we love women. I mean, mm -hmm. that's not yeah. gonna that's not gonna carry women in binders. Yeah, and but some, another, some, not, some of her best friends have. There's another point. Too. There's another point I want to make. <laughs> but it also becomes incumbent upon the Democratic Party, if it in fact this rainbow coalition, which could be the future, a progressive future, it also has to not necessarily change its message. It must consolidate its gains. It must move on labor. It's got to move on issues related to the African American community. It's got to consolidate those gains with the Hispanic Latino community because if it does not, then of course the Latino community in these communities could slip. So it's let's, but it's also, let's not be too quick yes. to write an obituary for the Republicans. Also, Bob's the only one who remembers. He's the only one of us old enough to remember that, uh, that, <laughs> that Barry Goldwater got demolished at, in a very conservative right. Republican Party in 1964 and remember what party won the presidency in 1968? And remember what happened the in 1972 when just as the Republicans were controlled by their right wing, the Democrats were controlled by, you know, right. the recently late Senator George McGovern. Right. And was that, that wing of, you know, you know where you have uh, the argument in parties is that your, is that your extremes control the nominating process, and then as, as Romney tried to do, you have to try to move to the Senate. He was very clumsy about it. Very but that's, but well, what's you're the, right. I mean, is there, there, is there a comparison that, between that, what happened with the Democrats in, after 1972? I mean, Bill Clinton and, and Barack Obama did not run as raving left wing right. well, but, there's been, but there's, there have been these demographic shifts in, over the time. And let's not forget. But there is more than no, demographics. In 1965, when Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act, he said, we just lost the South. That's right. In other words, there's he been a it. permanent shift mm -hmm. to this now enclave in the South that's solid now. But now what's changing that? I mean, one of the states I would also put in play potentially is Georgia, for example. Yes where you have a large African-American population, a growing Latino population that, that the Democratic Party has ignored. Mayor Jackson said you shouldn't do that. City. So I think that the demographics have to also be factored in. So my contention is, if the Democratic Party can be on point in terms of delivering to this rainbow constituency, it will consolidate its gains well into the future. If it fails to do that... Wait a minute. There's a big problem, I think, that Bob points out here. And I think you're, you know, you're fundamentally right in the aggregate. But the point about the nominating process, I think, can't be underestimated. And it's something, you know, that sometimes esoteric and people don't think about. Basically, it's about who votes in primaries. And, and in, who controls the party apparatus. Well, those right. are the people who right. vote in the primaries are the ones who control the apparatus. And they are the left wing generally in the Democratic Party who saw, you know, found God and decided they didn't want to lose anymore and the right wing in the Republican Party. As long as the... Who has to lose God a that's, little bit. <laughs> who has to definitely lose a little God. De and as long as you have the uh, conservative Christian coalition nominating the president from the right on the Republican Party, then I'm worried that the Democrats will look at this and say, you know, we really don't have to do much for our left flank because they have no place to go. And that, uh, that problem has always been the case in governing after even you win a big election and you have this new majority coalition. It's like if you're to the left in the Democratic Party, you have no place to go. The, that should be what happens in the Republican Party to the right. But they have actually dug in deeper on the right, and that's by, why they're losing national elections as well. Well, there's a it's, solution for that, and, and it's called a third force in American politics. And that's what the National Rainbow Coalition should have been but never became. In other words, I'm not sure we can count on the institutional Democratic Party or the political apparatuses to do that. We have to have a force outside of the Democratic and Republican Party, but in this instance, the Democratic Party, that's driving the discussion. And I'll make this point in that regard. Because there's always this notion about running to the center, as if there's some mythical platonic center that just sort of stands there. It is, it is malleable. It is, right. it is subject to be changed based on uh, political movement. Yeah, but there's movement. a center right to the center left. Yeah, but it, but, but it moves, Bob. But it when moves. you move let's look, let's, if further, you're going to be if you, look at mar if you look at marriage equality, it's moved. What right. was what was the that's center? Right. Absolutely right. It's moved, and that's my point: is you can drive the center somewhere, and you could drive it to the further to the left. And we've been pretty clumsy about doing that. And I think if we depend upon the institut institutional Democratic Party as the vehicle to do that, then we will not, as progressive, make the gains that we need to make. You made a good point, though, about marriage equality. That's be become a conservative issue. Who believe in the sanctity of a family, whether that family is a same-sex family, 
or a heterosexual family. It's been adopted by that. So we have seen that change that you're talking about. Well, there about. are many, many issues that way. It does, it does, it, it does social movements matter and, and how the message yes, they matter. matter and so forth. So that's, that's why I'm saying I'm not sure we can trust the institutional Democratic Party or campaigns to do that. I don't think, so we have to be able to push with a third force in American politics that is pushing and, and driving ideas, is educating, taking advantage of this, this moment to educate people about the importance of public but you would see that, private sector. But, but you would see that third force pushing, correct me if I'm wrong, pushing from the left. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I mean, Right now, the Tea Party is pushing from the right. <laughs> oh, and, and, but let me just say that. If I, I, if I have to say this, they push from the right and for a significant period of, of time, they were successful from the right. Because not only did they protest, they actually ran and won people for and organized. Party. Correct. But what we do on the left is we sometimes talk about it, but then we don't, we're not able to, to take our message in such a way that we grab average, ordinary people, which is, uh, at the end of the day, what has, what has to happen. The message has to be sufficiently popular to galvanize average, ordinary, working people. Isn't, or it's isn't part okay. of the genius of the two-party system for all of its problems, is is to take this kind of um, exactly. left wing pressure and subvert it and bring it into the, you know, g you know, you exactly. would rather have people inside the tent than outside the tent. In the case of the Republican Party, the wing took over the center. They they, they well, absolutely did. Although I, I think you know, as as we're talking about parties here, I think we need to think too about the extent to which individuals outside of a party apparatus accepting things like primaries, that they have to run that gantlet, right? That has to happen. Um, but individuals have outsized power. Uh, if you look at Republican Party spending this year, the Republican mm -hmm. Party was outraised by the Romney campaign. It was outspent by super PAC spending. Uh, and then you had the Republican Party. And there, you know, surely there is a Republican Party there that doesn't want to be outspent by the Sheldon Adelsons of this world, but they are. Uh, and they have to deal with that reality. Democrats have that problem, but to a lesser extent. And trying to look at this amalgam of issues, yes, the parties become large or tense. Democrats are much better poised to do that than the Republicans. But the very uh, uh, security of issues like marriage equality may make it easier for Republicans to come together on issues that they can put behind them. I'm not arguing that that's easy, and I'm not arguing it's likely, but going back to the 64-68 movement and 72 off into, uh, uh, off into 1992, um, I would be very reluctant to bury the Republicans today. Forty, fifty years ago, James McGregor Burns wrote about four-party politics in America, where he said that we don't have two. We have congressional Democrats and presidential Democrats, right. congressional Republicans and presidential Republicans, and we still have that today. That hasn't really changed. Except that you've lost, I mean, you've lost the blue dog Democrats, you've lost the uh, more they are congressional Republicans. Democrats. Those people have been cleansed. I mean, what's the, what's the uh, proper term? Right. You know, that, that as, Eliminated. <laughs> as true believers, you know, I don't mean to, you know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, yeah. uh, true believers who are less amenable, handling is the technical term, or who were, <laughs> who were, who were, less, amenable, who were less amenable to cutting a deal. Right, yeah. but and you do not have you know, the right. there, there are a whole bunch of other reasons for that. The National Republican Party doesn't exist anymore the way it did in that period. It is a reflection of the Southern Republicans essentially and now and Western, of course. And that's because of the and party, uh, the primary apparatus. Right. So I would also argue at this point through. it's because we elected a president who doesn't look like any of the presidents, who, and he has and he has a funny name. Yeah. So I mean, I think that there's a, that there's also a tremendous cultural phenomenon and the idea of trying to take our country back, you know, when um, I'm oh, not sure I, anybody took over our country. Well, so I, I don't think I, we I, lost it. I mean, <laughs> and I, I really think that's a factor. And I think when you talk about all the changes and, and how you went from Barry Goldwater being obliterated in 64 to what happened later, I mean, you really do have to understand, I think, the, the sort of backlash, the white backlash against the success and progress of the civil rights movement. But I also think that even though the blue dogs sometimes come under criticism, I'm one of the lefties who often talk to my brothers and sisters saying, wait a minute, I'd rather have a blue dog who votes with me six out of ten. Or who nine, organizes with me. Or uh, than not have one. Yeah. See, so the Democratic Party still has a bigger tent, even in terms of conservative, you know, look at right. Joe Manchin out of West Virginia. He's pretty conservative. So you've got a bigger tent. The problem in terms of the point that you were making earlier in terms of cutting a deal is you don't, there's nobody to deal with on the Republican side anymore. I mean, because they're... Because they're, it's almost a yeah, parliamentary are, system. Yeah, they are right. a, they are purist. 
ideologically right. conservative, and that used to not be the case. If you look at the Civil Rights Bill, for example, Lyndon Johnson lost much of the site, but mm -hmm. he could cut it. He had, he had um, Javits, Keating, Case, right. all all Republicans. Everett Dirksen, the silver-haired orator from from uh, from Illinois. Peoria. I mean, he had somebody there to work with. Besides, you know, since we're all political junkies, exactly. we enjoy talking about this. So, well, what's it all mean? <laughs> what is it? Uh, what does it mean going forward in terms of the ability or inability? To cut this deal, uh, we're not. We're not. Uh, we don't have endless amounts of time right now. I mean, the you know the you know Congress tied its own hands in saying in creating the fiscal cliff, saying we're going to threaten such we're going to threaten such destruction that we that you know we're gonna stop us come before together. we kill again. You know, yeah, and you know <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna you know you're gonna, we're going to force ourselves to act. Well, and they, then they almost and they almost put the country into bankruptcy on 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 the not into bankruptcy on the but public they, debt. They, it, well, they did I mean, cost the, so, the mean, debt ceiling. They did cost us a credit rating. They, but, what, but what happened as a result of that? People flocked to U.S. Treasuries, mm -hmm. even when Standard and Poor's lowered the credit rating. Mm -hmm. It's still a secure investment, it's, even with a lowered credit rating. And you know, again, we have to we throw around terms that a lot of intelligent people don't really understand. The debt ceiling, for example, that doesn't mean we're borrowing some more. It means we have the ability to pay the mm -hmm. debt yes. we've already incurred. And indeed, I would argue that if you look at the Constitution closely, and I, have, I think I have a copy of it in my <laughs> pocket, uh, the, uh, uh, the 14th Amendment says we don't even need the debt ceiling right. vote in Congress. Well, because right. it, you know, it's, well that's uh, exactly what the president is looking at. Well, right, but he, right, that's an option right he, hasn't, he hasn't chosen to exercise. Which right. he could have exercised. Yeah, yeah but right. the question is yeah. still on the table, which is, yeah. is this president going to get anything done in his second term because it's still a divided government? But well, let's, let's get done in the what, next three months. He doesn't have to do anything. a very discreet period of time. He doesn't have to do anything. He will. He can no, can let, there's going to be a deal. He can let the Bush tax cuts expire. And then have the Democrats pass right. a tax bill for everything that, but that, the top that lowers tax rates on the first two hundred fifty thousand dollars in income. Let the Republicans vote against but that. But see what he you're saying. That. Either way, then the president wins, which is mm -hmm. what I think. Either but the fiscal cuts, cliff is a different issue. No, either he cuts the a deal sequesters on sequesters are a totally different right. issue. Right. But I, I mean, here's where I don't believe uh, certain of those things will ever go into effect, like the stuff around the military. So I, I don't. I don't, you know, he's going to put on the table a lot of important social programs that many of us in cities don't want to see cut. So either way, the programs that most of us care about will get cut. For instance. And he will be, um, he, will cut, he will cut community development block grants. He will cut daycare block grants. He will cut food stamps. He will cut Medicare. He will cut Medicaid. He will cut any kind of money that goes to the states and passes through. He will cut workforce investment. He will cut all of the programs that are human capital programs, that build human capital, because that will be, if there's a deal, that will be part of the deal. So either way, I believe from his perspective, he wins. Either it's the scenario mm -hmm. that you've just articulated in which the Republicans don't come to the table in good faith mm -hmm. and nothing happens, they don't get a deal, and then the tax cuts all go through, and then he forces them to vote another but time. I think the tax we have the other side. Right. Too. But the, the cuts, so the sequence, right. so there will be, he will have a slightly less control over the cuts that he is going to make anyway. So that's my, I don't usually predict on this, but is all they're saying over and over again is, yes, if you give us some revenue enhancements, folks, that means taxes, tax increases, then we will put cuts on the table. So what are they putting on the table? They're not putting the military on the table. So the military stuff will be restored behind closed doors with the back deal. And what they will put on the table are all these social programs that I've just articulated. So either way, you're going to get those cuts that ostensibly impact the fiscal cliff. And the only thing the economists care about are the tax cuts, which they believe if middle class people don't keep their tax cut, there'll be less money to spend and the economy will then fall back into Well, recession. it's also but that the there, rest there of are that other spending, things. They don't care, economists, yeah. about the rest of that spending. Uh -huh. The other things that are the, the know, psychological impact, that. though, if you were to change, for example, the mortgage interest tax deduction, what that ends up doing is lowering the value of your home. 
And if you roll that through, the econ we economists have a term that we call the wealth effect, which says that for every dollar you feel wealthier in year one, you spend a couple of pennies more in year two, and the reverse. So if your net worth goes down because the value of your home goes down, you stop spending, or you reduce your spending. 70% of our economy is built on consumer spending. And then and we go into the, the canard that government doesn't create jobs, and the government doesn't build anything. <laughs> and it's true. You know, the Defense Department doesn't build anything. That may be so. <laughs> but it also buys paper for its copying machines. It buys copying machines. It buys computers. And somebody has to make them. And airplanes and tanks. Uh, exactly. Well, I'm not even, go right, I'm not right, even going right. that far. Right. And toilet paper. Let me, yeah. I, I, Very important purchase. I, I think. All of the above is correct. That uh, I'm guardedly optimistic that there will, in fact, be a deal before we get to December 20th. I hope so. I, I think, think that so. that could you absolutely. I actually think don't. so and, too. And, and, and it is probably, in, in, if I had to guess, going to be a bigger deal than some think it will be. Just a sort of big, you know, a small term, a short term plug, uh, and then we actually get the serious work done later. Because the president's leverage, in some respects, uh, erodes over time, with the exception of the tax cut piece. But I'd like to introduce another factor here, and that's Sandy. Um, you know, we just had a devastating natural catastrophe. Uh, I, I think that there is a very solid coalition building for some very serious infrastructure investments that have their greatest resonance right here in terms of uh, flood control, surge calming, et cetera. Uh, but if that happens, and it's being talked about in a lot of places, and there are a lot of people trying to figure out, well, if it happens there, it will be politically unsustainable for it not to happen in some other places as well. Some of it is technically impossible. You're not going to protect the Florida coastline, et cetera, et cetera. But <laughs> other kinds of infra infrastructure spending, this could be the pivot point for a truly grand deal that would also invest significantly more money uh, in a whole variety of places. In the United You're talking States. CCC again, or something yeah, like that, or well, WPA. But do you think all the governors who turned scale. down the stimulus money, who are still in power, mm -hmm. are going to take this money? I mean, I yes, hope I you're do. right. I yeah, hope I you're right. I, I hope that Sandy is the crisis that I moves it, it move this needle. This but if we but keep I don't see the Republican governors stepping up and saying, when, give us more infrastructure money. When Chris Christie does it. Except for uh, Chris when, Christie, when, but yeah, hey. He's unusual. Chris uh, Christie is I, in a Democratic state. Chris changes. Christie but is the governor of but, a Democratic but point, state. At what, but at what point do average ordinary people in these states who are suffering, you know, who maybe they aren't aware they're suffering yet, begin to see, well, wait a minute. There's something going on here with government, and these yeah. states are improving, and we're still stuck in the mud. Well, that's the I think I, I don't know how long this particular line of argument can continue to go with these. I mean, this revolt by these governors in, in the in the South, or but not well, more than just the South, Ohio, Wisconsin. Right. Yeah, but I mean, I, yeah, but um, yeah, I know, but it's but it's very right. strong in the South. But right. I don't I don't know how long that can go on in the face of people facing suffering and seeing other states actually progressing because. It's not well, necessarily big government, but this but is about government communication. Is doing something. This it's, is it was a problem with Obamacare that people, when you have a situation in which the people who most benefit from legislation are against it, it means they're misinformed or uninformed, or as and, you, and, and or the Democratic Party and the president have not been as effective as the other right, side. and also which an is what you said bias. earlier, which is very important. This administration, in the past term didn't figure out how to explain to people exactly the things you articulated, which needs to be done. He needs to mobilize public opinion. That's his only leverage with, with Congress. I think you're absolutely right about that. So let's see it happen. Well, so far, the, there's nothing to indicate to me that he can take his, you know, his election game and bring it to governing. They didn't, you know, they have all this spectacular ground game. Which, 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 which they didn't use last time. But he, mm -hmm. there is, he a, there is an that. indication, and beginning, I guess, this week, that he's going on the road yeah. around the tax question, yeah. that he will okay. this time I'm ready. use the bully pulpit by being on the road, interfacing and interacting with ordinary people. And he's urging people to use Twitter and uh, other yeah. social media. You mean that he media. might actually realize that being a politician can be an effective tool? <laughs> well, hey, you know, it takes... It takes <laughs> when it you're takes, governing. It takes, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it takes two terms to graduate, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, we're going to go to questions. We're going to go to we're going to go to questions in a second. Uh, let me go to questions. Give us, tell me your name, tell me your campus, and ask your question. Speak up, please. Uh, my name is Obafemi Oyanura. Uh, from Baruch College. Uh, my question is uh, is this: Some months ago, we saw uh, Mr. President using executive orders to help the immigrants to this country. Uh, in case of this 
uh, problem in voting in the house to prevent the physical cliff or whatever they call it. Is there any executive order that vested in the hand of Mr. President to prevent such a physical cliff for the country? I'm not, did you understand the question? Yes. There, uh, I, uh, is there an executive order that the president can pass that will help avert the crystal, uh, the, the, the fiscal cliff? Uh, if, if we accept the cliff it's, analogy at one right. level, uh, one thing he could do is issue an executive order for the IRS not to recalculate the brackets until after the first quarter. That's permissible within the structure of the IRS, and that would at least prevent, you know, give us another uh, uh, three months to negotiate this. He can't through executive order, make the, make the problems go away completely, but he can delay them in significant ways. But wouldn't, but since, uh, I don't think, I think that, that this particular divided government shows it doesn't act without an absolute deadline, wouldn't that just push exactly. the question off? It, it, the would, it would not be in his interest to do right. it. It just, it right. is possible. Except for he it has a different, done. a slightly different makeup of the Senate and the House if yep. he does that. Yep. And if the Democrats, Democrats take action on the filibuster rule in the Senate, you know, it makes it a little easier, a yes. little easier to come to a solution. And you have the sense that there is a, no, there is some sense that John Boehner right. would want to make a deal if he this wasn't week. so hamstrung by his own caucus. Right. Yeah. I'm, by, not, by I'm not Eric convinced Cantor. by that. <laughs> yeah. I'm not convinced of that. Yes. Hi, my name is Dinera Salceda. I'm from John Jay College. My question is, what kind of initiatives or deals does this administration need to make to address the the support they receive from groups such as Asians, Latinos, or women? Well, but are they going to, I mean, uh, when you say um, issues that are important to those groups, those are issues that are important to all groups that impact particular groups in, in greater ways. I mean, um, I think you were, I, I think you were making I, I, that I, point, yeah, that it's more uh, than just demographic. It, it is, but I, but I, I think the question, I mean. Immigration I, being well, it, an it exception is, to that because it's so, it's so linked to people who come here from other countries and the kind of racism that affects people who are even and, citizens. And, and, I think it's, and I think it is perceived, and to some degree justifiably, as an issue that is of paramount importance to the Latino community. And I think the way that has to be addressed... Well, I think, that, I think that, that, that's part of why the Asian community voted so strongly for the president as well. Well, it may right. well be. Right. But, I mean, but the Latinos look, look, are the 800-pound yeah, gorilla. Yeah, you're right. Issue. If you look right. at the demographics, it's right. overwhelmingly. But, I mean, but, I mean, I'm working on this issue, too, where I'm right. concerned about Haitians and, and mm -hmm. continental Africans and others. But I think the, the president has to meet boldly now. There's some momentum on his side to try to get a comprehensive uh, immigration bill passed. And I think there's some... Uh, uh, Republicans now who have, you know, have seen the light and will perhaps go back to a previous position that John McCain had when he was trying to work with Kennedy and others to get it done. And I think there's a reasonable prospect now that there will be comprehensive Im immigration reform and the president should push that. He needs to push buttons, every one of the, he needs to push buttons for labor, for Asians, for different groups to let them know clearly that this new coalition can... He's, I don't think thing. he's going to push those buttons. I really don't. I think the immigration issue will get resolved because that one can be resolved mm -hmm. without big expenditures. And there, there's a lot in the DREAM Act or something comparable to that that can be passed and you will find some Republicans who cross over on it. But most of the issues of concern to the communities you uh, focus on are people, are people who live in cities and they require some form of expenditures. And those are the areas that everyone, including the Democrats, have targeted for cuts. So I'm, you know, so much less optimistic than I normally am about these things. Because if you look at his previous term, you had the education reform, race to the top. Or you look at Clinton, all of Clinton's grandiose policies, his empowerment zones, they funded the amount of money that went into these programs was minuscule. The race to the top money, minuscule. So Is the president unencumbered because he doesn't have to run for re-election? He doesn't have to make decisions, worrying about what's going to happen, how it's going to affect the well, next in some vote? Ways, that's a big question. The question is, will the, will, is there a real Obama in that regard, and will no. he stand I mean, up? No, I mean, but isn't he constrained question. by the budget that deal well, that well, he has today? Well, 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 I mean, there's a reason. He had two it's constraints. Like Clinton, let me just, let me Clinton one decided more. Let me, let me to balance put, the budget so that Bush could spend all the surplus well, away. Why are Democrats so stupid? one on the table. The African-American community is a community that you're going to increasingly hear screaming about urban policy because there is a state of emergency in urban America that affects blacks and Latinos mm -hmm. and he needs to target jobs whatever money is available economic to these communities because otherwise that 3% 
drop will get further and further down because there is some rumbling and disaffection because in New York, for example, you know, according to the Community Service Society, about 50% of blacks uh, under the age of 30 males are out of work, and that's a state mm -hmm. of emergency. So there's a piece of legislation. It's called the Workforce Investment Act. Every year they cut, they try and cut money out of this, which is a minuscule amount of money that helps a small percentage of people. We have legislation and programs on the table which are underfunded for the populations that need to be served. They're not, the same struggle is happening to keep existing revenues in place. I don't see anybody proposing expanding any of these programs or articulating anything new. When they do articulate something new, it's precisely around symbolic politics. Race to the Top is a great example of symbolic politics. We did so much around education education, what they did was, you know, they forced the states to come together and create plans, and they put a drop of money into that plan, and then they said, oh, states, go raise that money yourself from the private sector mm -hmm. or from philanthropy or tax your people. But so this is the new model. This is what Clinton did, and this is what Obama did, and I don't, I don't see the bold initiatives like Johnson put it, or I want well, Johnson I'm, or Nixon, no, for I God's sake, go right? I'm going to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of my students, so I better shut up. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Ashley Torres. How is he as a professor? Is he okay? He's a great professor. Okay. <laughs> I hope you made a note of that. <laughs> um, I attend your college, and you had stated what does it mean going forward? And my question is in regard to an immigration reform. Um, the Hispanic community has played a big influential role in this election. And I was wondering, do you see in the foreseeable future some type of immigration reform, such as like the passing of the DREAM Act and or the DREAM Fund? And it's more than that. I mean, will, no. the, immigration, will the immigration reform include a path to citizenship? Yes, and I mean, which is the... I mean, to me, what is immigration reform if not including a mm -hmm. path to citizenship? It has to. I, I think the quick answer to that is yes, there's going to be yes. immigration reform. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I think that it will include a path to citizenship. Right now, senators, uh, uh, outgoing senators Kyle and Hutchinson have a co-sponsored bill right now uh, to create a, uh, it's basically, it's the bad DREAM Act. Uh, it's the DREAM Act without a path <laughs> to citizenship. And I don't think that's what happens. Good. I like the that. Nightmare that's Act. That's a good one. Yeah, the yeah, Nightmare Act. The bad DREAM Act. Right. All right. Yes, let me take another question here. Hello, my name is Paolo Cremides. Uh, I go to Brooklyn College. My question is, um, when you look at the southern congressional races, you look at people like Kirsten Sinema and Pete Gallego that won in the South that are, you know, traditionally wouldn't win, and atheists would never get elected to Congress. So my question is, is with the changes to, uh, changing demographics in the South, could the congressional southern Democrat be redefined as a more progressive legislator? Hmm. I think that, you know, the southern Democrats that come from the college town areas and the larger cities will be progressive to the liberal Southern Democrats. So if you're getting elected from Atlanta or you're getting elected from the triangle, the research triangle in North Carolina, you're going to have an agenda that's more reflective of those populations. And as these populations expand, as, as people on the panel were saying, uh, that could change the whole complexion of the Southern delegation, including if the Republican Party doesn't transform it won't even win in the South anymore. I mean, I think these, you know, this is a matter of time. Um, yes, sir. Um, hey, my name is George from the College of Staten Island. Uh, my question is, um, there are many rumors of uh, Rubio running in 2016. Do you believe he can be the saving face of the Republican Party? And do you believe Rubio is enough to capture the Hispanic vote or any of the non-white vote? Well, I mean, how much is, Demo you know, that's... Is, is demographic Part of it depends destiny. on who, who he's running against. Well, it's also, I mean, yeah. but, well, can but he I mean, get the, the nomination you know, underlying well that together. question is that a black candidate has well, a special way, pull right. on, you know, on on black voters. I mean, you know, well, not uh, necessarily, a, I mean, though, the, you know, but I mean, but that's the underpinning of the of the of the yeah, question. Yeah, but the, but the but the but again, I'll do, I'll just, the message is important. You could not run Clarence Thomas in the black community and get zero. I mean, you get zero or Herman votes, Cain or Herman Cain right. or Alan Keyes or. Right. You know, I, it's just or funny. Alan West. I, yeah, well, Alan yeah. West, right? I mean, he, you know, and I, it's, I was sitting. Not Al Sharpton. A whole bunch of a whole bunch of um, you, you turn on television, you see all of these black Republican consultants. I happened to bump bump into one uh, in Washington the other day. <laughs> I turned to him. I said, "Well, gee, you're a consultant. I mean, you're, you're not doing very well in, in my business. You get fired because you're not you're not getting us. So it has to do with message. So Rubio, who I, you know, he's a Tea Partier, and so the question is, will will he? 
uh, have a, a message that's mainstream to the Latino community, and then can he build beyond that? I, I don't suspect he'll be a presidential candidate. He's more likely vice presidential candidate uh, for Marco Rubio. Wasn't he a, wouldn't he have been a better vice presidential candidate this year? Well, I think so. I mean, I think so. But I think, again, the, the, the blinders were there. And uh, as I think was mentioned earlier, the, the, uh, Romney got trapped on the right. I mean, he made so many yep. outrageous statements on the right, and he tried to get back to the middle and almost made it in that first debate before, you know, it, it's... That's mm -hmm. a sketch. That's a sketch. Yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Amber, and I attend Borough Manhattan Community College. I was wondering, you guys mentioned before that voters were uninformed. Uh, what are your suggestions for perhaps informing them? I think I have a laundry list. I, I mean, we do a, we do. Listen to us. My colleagues, not here. <laughs> I'm the only one, Bob and I are the only ones here who are not academics. Right. But, uh, I mean, we do a lousy job in, in high school. But we were reporters, teaching. so it's really yeah. our fault. We do a lousy <laughs> job in high schools, I think, of, of teaching civics and teaching basic things about government. And we have to do a better job of that. So people, there are people who don't know the difference between a congressman, a councilman, an assemblyman, a state senator, and go to each one of them for, for issues that they have no influence over. I mean, so I'm have, excited yeah. about the internet as a vehicle for informing mm -hmm. voters. I worked on a project, um, go, to, go to this website, whosontheballot.org, and the whole purpose of this was New York City-based, uh, tell you by putting in your address who's on the ballot with links to information about candidates, making it easy for people to start that self-education process. What we found was the most important factor, and this has been uh, replicated in other studies, is Facebook, sent it, you are sending to your friends information about candidates. It's going viral. It's affecting your knowledge base. That It used to be people got their information about elections from commercials mm -hmm. on TV. So don't think you, your generation is, you know, way behind previous ones. Now, there's really an opportunity here to make information inexpensive and simple to access. People are busy. They're not going to really change how much time they spend on politics, but we can make it easy for them and we can make it more accessible. And I really believe all aspects of social media and the web uh, can really help this. I also and think Esther, Esther and very, I. Very, very quickly. Yeah. Uh, j very quickly, they absolutely can help, and I'm equally enthusiastic. Just two points. One, it's already out there. There's a tremendous amount of stuff out there right now, and I think we do have to put some of the onus on the citizenry. Uh, you can click on the, your favorite website. It could be Esther's website. It could be any other, uh, but there is information out there. Number two is that the net also makes it easier to band into tribal factions and not to pay any attention to anybody who doesn't think exactly the way that you do. And we have to be smarter and take the responsibility of also it in a smarter way. That's an interesting point, but, uh, you know, about uh, getting right. information that's not yours. It's the echo Somebody, chamber. Somebody's done a uh, studies that show the Google search, when you put in something, you get responses based on your previous activity. Yes. So that means well, if Google has designed the algorithm that but way. But if you yeah. have, if you've <laughs> constantly been looking up progressive or liberal sources, when you look for a particular issue, you will first get the progressive or liberal side of it. But I was going to say that Esther and I sit on the board of the Citizens Union. One of the, the object, the objective of which, one of them at least, is for voter education and to well, create a more informed and, and it's also the case that one of the reasons you saw um, uh, lat, lat, Latinos, blacks, Asians, young women vote in the way they did is they felt they had something at stake. That whatever the, mm -hmm. whatever the you know, media clutter is, that message that they had something at stake, at well, least in a negative way. That's right. That's right. In terms of feeling it's threatened time. by the Republicans, drove people out to vote. Yes, sir. Hello, good evening. We don't have much time, so please. All right, my name is East Phileas, and I'm from um, John Jay. Uh, my question is, how can the Republican Party stay relevant and reshape amongst the growing minorities within the next election, whether it be congressional or presidential? Well, it wasn't that long ago, meaning 1960, uh, prior to the Voting <laughs> Rights Act. I guess that is a long time ago. It's not that long ago to me when blacks were a Republican constituency, you know, you know dating back, dating from, the, dating from the Civil War. I mean, Jackie... Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson, you know, mm -hmm. was, uh, was, uh, was, was a Nixon Republican. Guy. Yeah, and mm -hmm. of course it was uh, 1960 was the decisive moment when uh, John F. Kennedy made that famous f phone call to, uh, to um, Martin, Martin Luther King. King that made a shift. But even in the election against Clinton, 
uh, Dole got 16% of the black vote. I mean, if you, if you can imagine the difference between 93% and 16, I mean, if 16% of black folks had voted for Romney, he'd be president. That's I mean, you know, so th that's how far the Republican that's Party has drifted. <laughs> and it has to do, again, with message. It has to do with a perception of what's in the, in the general interest of, of, of a particular community, a particular constituency, and the Republican Party is out to lunch. I mean, this could open up a, no, a new issue, but the Voting Rights Act is coming back up before the Supreme, Supreme Court. Court. Supreme Court. Yes. Um, but, you know, the good news for everybody in this room is that, you know, voters are not as stupid as politicians would like to think you are. And that in this last election, people voted primarily on a set of issues in which the Republican Party was insulting. 47% of the population, remember that? Spent mm -hmm. tons of money. But you also have... Spending um, that money insulting people. Just as, the, you know, just as the Republicans had to rebuild from the ashes of Goldwater, just as the Democrats had to rebuild from the ashes of McGovern, you know, these political parties have survived for, you know, the, you know, the Democrats for over 200 years, the Republicans for 165 years, because they, ha because they are amenable to change. They and are, that's the you know, that they are plus, kind of, plus. you know, organisms well, change in order, in, in order to survive. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's what we're seeing. We have, a, we, have about 30, we have about 30 seconds left. Do they come to a grand bargain? Is, are they so hyperpolarized that they can't come, come to some agreement? I think they come to a bargain. We'll figure out later whether it's grand. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, oh, yes, deal. I think they I'll, absolutely uh, I'll come to a I'll endorse what David said. Yeah, um, I think it's going to be grand. And I think, you know, <laughs> I think what's clear is that the cost, uh, that the cost of not coming to an agreement is there's more than a political cost. Absolutely. And, and yeah. the cost is going to affect every one of us and every one of your lives. I, we, I just got the goodbye sign. As I told you, as a reporter, I always make deadline. Um, thank you all. We'll see you next time on the CUNY Forum.